All right, so hard edges are where you have a dark or light object, whatever it is, it's a shape that goes directly from that color or value to the next one. So for example, I go from black to white and there's not much transition in between. A soft edge is when I have an object, I'm gonna make the same shape, I'm gonna make it a dark square as well. But instead of having sharp edges where the transition is from dark to light, I have blurry edges. We call those soft edges. Because this is pencil, I can also use my finger to kind of rub it. Make it nice, soft and blurry. That's a really soft edge. Now the center can be just as dark as in this one. But visually, this feels lighter than this. So when you do a lot of soft edges, things tend to be blurrier, but they also tend to feel like they have a lighter value to them than they really do because the softness of the edge tends to, to make it feel that way. So where do you see a lot of soft edges? Usually you'll see them like in the, in the distance, for example, or in the periphery of your eyes. The same is true if you have a camera and you focus on one thing and then the, like, like for example, the new iPhones to have that portrait mode, what portrait mode basically is, is it focuses on the person that you're taking the picture of and blurs everything else out. It has soft edges around the person and the person themselves, they have harder edges. So the background fades away, you don't notice it, it becomes indistinct. So soft edges can be really valuable for helping to create an area that you don't want the eye to go to first. If you did a lot of soft edges in your area and then you did a lot of contrast and sharp edges, in another, your eye will naturally go to the area of sharp edges first and go to the soft edges, they'll be the secondary part. So as an artist, on a 2D surface, like a canvas, remember I've told you guys before how our job is a little bit like um, a manipulator? We're trying to manipulate other people into seeing what we want them to see. So if I have an area that's in sharp focus, like a portrait, for example, and I do a lot of high contrast in the portrait, and I've got a lot of sharp edges. Everything around it, if it's just kind of soft and fluffy and blurry, fades away and instead that, that face and the eyes, wherever the area of highest contrast is, will be what I see first. Just because a photograph has sharp edges everywhere. A lot of photographs capture everything in, in high detail. Doesn't mean you need to paint it that way. So imagine I'm doing a portrait again. Let's, let's imagine that I'm just thinking of a basic portrait of somebody. And I wanna do a lost edge. So a lost edge is where maybe I've got a gal with dark hair and she's sitting against a backdrop that's really dark on the top half. Now maybe there's a, a light source coming through on one side and so I see a highlight on her hair here. But everything else gets lost. You don't see where her hair starts or stops. That dark gets lost. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it goes from when the values are exactly the same and I could just lose that edge just keep the highlights so that I have the form of her head, but I'm losing the edges of her hair, the distinctiveness of her hair. What will happen then is her eyes and her features will really stand out more. And that really pops out now, her face, because it's sitting in a whole mass of dark. I don't even have to see where, where all her hair goes to. I can see that it continues down here, but I've lost the edges up here. So if I don't want to, maybe I can instead move her so that the backdrop has the darkness below. A lot of times that will happen because there'll be a chair behind, the, behind your person and the chair might be darker. So maybe I have a lost edge in her, her sweater if she's wearing a sweater or where her, her hair falls down below. There's quite a difference depending on the mood that you're trying to create with the painting. Think about the background if you're doing a portrait or an animal. 
the, that background can make a big difference. And sometimes it could be something that you don't want to lost. Edges can also manipulate something. So for example, like our clouds, right? Let's say I have a bunch of clouds in the sky and our clouds are really fluffy on top and more flat on the bottom. So in our photograph that we're working from, we have these clouds. They're darker on the bottom. They're really fluffy on top and they're kind of flattish on the bottom. I notice that a lot of times with those types of clouds, you know, they're fluffy on the top and kind of flat on the bottom. Um, there was a little bit of values and stuff that happened. Now, if I was to really soften this edge in this direction, look what happens. So if I was to take that, that bottom dark edge and soften it in an up and down direction, what does that look like? Right. So as a painter, I could take that picture of a cloud and make it look like it's raining in the distance by softening that edge with an up and down. That's just a way to manipulate. So edges can be used to also create an idea that there's some action happening too. Same thing if I um, had a picture of, um, let's say, I don't know, let's say I had, had a dude that's going to be a terrible little drawing. Do, do, do. Do. Okay, so let's say I had a picture of a dude. You can tell he's running, right? But if I was just to draw and paint him like this, well, that's one thing. But if I was to draw and paint him and then blur the edges of the color on the back side of his body, look what happens. Now I'm creating a sense of, of movement. Mm -hmm. One more example. I do a lot of teacups. So I'll have like, you know, these, these teacup shapes. If I want the gleam to really stand out against the background, I gotta make the background darker. So anytime I want something to look really, like, like it stands out, I can't make my whites lighter than white. White is the lightest it can be. So if I want white to really pop out, everything else around it has to be a lot darker. So let's say I have this teacup, do to do, and it's on a dark background, and I want to have a gleam like right over here somewhere. The darker that everything else is, the more that that gleam is going to stand out. So then when I put in my white, it's much better with paint because it's really going to be thick white paint. Now I've got a little gleam, right? Because it's sitting on top of something that's not white anymore. It's a gray teacup, but putting the white gleams make it look lighter. Maybe I have a couple lines in there. But if I want it to look like glowy gleam, I've got to create soft edges around that highlight. So I can go in and just kind of soften up the edges, giving it a glow and then go back in the center and really make it bright white inside. Another thing I can do is create kind of this starburst kind of a look to really make it look like it gleams, like it has its own light source. That's another way that I can make something look like it's really bright and shiny. So let's take a look at our photo for this week. It's a photo of a series of clouds. And this is a sharp photo that I gave you. I also had the blurry photo that I emailed to you. But this is what I think, see when I squint my eyes. I just see it like blurrier and less distinctive, okay? That's what I'm talking about when I'm saying squint. Take away all the detail. And I'm working with acrylic paint today. So I thought acrylic paint would be great for this lesson because edges are easier to manipulate with oils because oil paint stays wetter longer. And acrylic is much harder to manipulate because it dries so fast. I'm not going to worry about the fast dry time. I'm just going to leave it. Okay, there are a couple ways I could do this. I could paint the whole the sky darker blue. Like, even look at the sky, guys, where you can see it poking through the top. Look at how dark the blue is. And look at the bottom where it pokes through. It's very, very light. The sky is usually darkest right above us and then gets lighter off, down, off in the distance. I could paint the entire sky first and then paint the clouds on top of it. Or I could just squint my eyes and start painting some stuff where I see it and leave the whites of the clouds for now. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use my, my big filbert brush. All right, so I'm just going to go here. I'm going to look at this cerulean blue and, and just push and wiggle it into my brush and take a look at Look at how close that is to our color. It's really close. I might add a touch of white. 
I'm just going to add enough blue that I can paint it in there. But here's the thing, the more water I add, the more see-through that color is. And already cerulean blue is a little see-through. So I'm just going to mix more paint. And if I need to, I can use a palette knife. Okay. So now look at the difference between that and this. Can you see a difference? Mm -hmm. See how that's just see-through? Mm -hmm. I was using water to help the paint move around, which I want to do, but the more water I have, the more see-through the color is. So you got to be careful. It's a balance between how much water or how little water. I'd rather use more paint. And also, I'm not worried about making perfect clouds. I'm squinting my eyes. You guys can see it from where you're sitting. And as I continue going down, I'm just going to add more white to my blue. Any areas of really soft, fluffy clouds, I'm just going to paint right over. So maybe what I'll do real quick is I'll focus on this land so that this stuff has a chance to dry so I can show you how you can do soft edges with acrylic. I think that's really important. So my land, I want the color to be a little different. I'm going to take my ultramarine blue. If I look at it, it's just a little too vibrant, too blue for that land. If I'm looking at my photo, I see a little bit, a tiny bit of green in that color. So I'm going to add a little bit of yellow to that blue, but still a little too dark. So I'm going to add some white. Oh, I went too light. So I'm going to add more blue. It's always that back and forth. If you guys are going back and forth and you feel like you're not doing it right, don't stress. That's, that's the process, back and forth. Getting much closer now. I'm going to add a touch of brown to help dull down that color. Sometimes color by itself is just too vibrant, so you add a complementary color to help dull it down. I'm going to start painting that in. So now what I've got is kind of a grayish with a lean towards um, green, blue. And this light blue on top of it is very wet. So if I have wet paint, this is for my acrylic painters and my oil painters. If you're working wet next to wet, you have to constantly wipe your brush off when you overlap with the, the wet paint beside it. So if I've got this dark blue, it's going to start mixing in with that lighter blue, which is still wet. Now, I have a little trick for making a straight line. So if I know I want my water to be straight and I want it to be, let's say, the same, it, if I want it to be straight, it's got to be the same width on that canvas. So let's say it's like this inch. What I do is I'll, I'll put my brush on my, I'll put the paint on my brush and I'll put my pinky on one edge. I turn the canvas so I can do that and I just drop my arm. Now I know my water is going to be straight. I do this for my buildings too, where I need lines to be straight. Horizon lines need to be straight. So I'll just put my pinky on that canvas and now I have that nice straight line. And I'll add some other values to my water here in a bit, but for now I'll just paint it nice and dark. And see how that different color of blue, it actually looks so much better next to that blue. If I had exactly, if I just used one blue throughout the painting, the painting would look like a monochromatic painting. So that's why it can be nice to have a warm and a cool of each of your colors. Okay. So I'm going to clean this brush off a bit, and I'm going to stick with this brush just for a minute. I'm going to use the smaller brush for that, that bottom area there. But for now, real quick. And sometimes, even in the sky, I'll see multiple gr blues. Um, my entire um, series of paintings of Italy, I've got different colors of blue and sometimes purple in my skies. The sky right above us is going to be the most purpley blue, and then it gets more greenish blue as it goes off in the distance during the day. And at night, you might just see shades of purples going up to almost a black at the top, depending. You know, look at, really critically, look at what you're painting and squint your eyes and see and think about what it is that you're you're working with but a lot of times especially in tropical areas or like um the desert like arizona i've gone out to sedona and painted 
and you're talking about three different blues in that sky. You're talking ultramarine blue up here, cerulean blue here, and a turquoise down at the bottom that's almost white. And it's just incredible. All right, so the clouds. There's darks and lights in the clouds, and I'm not gonna worry about the darks quite yet. I'm gonna start with my middle values. So what I'm, what I'm seeing, it's, a, it's kind of a grayish color in the centers that leans towards blue, but I'm gonna put some brown into it too. I wanna make sure that the color isn't too flat. So I'm working with the complementaries. Brown is just a darker version of orange, right? So I'm gonna make sure I mix a little bit of brown in there. <coughs> and brown and blue are gray for me anyways. So I've taken some blue and some brown and put them together. And now I'm gonna mix some white in with them. So see that nice, this is why I would not use black in my palette usually, is because if I used black, I would get one shade of gray and that's it. But if I use um, blue and, and brown, see if I mix more brown in there, now I've got a warmer gray. And anytime I have a big area of color, I want some grays that are warmer and I want some grays that are gonna be cooler. I'm gonna start with this gray. It's kind of a, a, a little bit warmer than, than blue. And then I'll add some cooler, cooler grays in there as well. But again, if I just used blue and white, and maybe just a touch of brown, what I just get is, is the whole painting will look monochromatic. But by adding that brown and making the clouds a little bit more brownish gray, hopefully it'll bring this piece more to life. We shall see. Okay, some of this blue is kind of dry and I see some, some um, very low level or high level clouds that are kind of like thin veils. If I take that brush and push and wiggle it so that the bristles really splay, then I'm really loading that brush on the inside and the out. If I then just take my paper towel, and I usually have my paper towel in my left hand as I'm painting, and I just wipe it off. Then if I hold the, the brush, not like this, not like a pencil, but parallel to the canvas and just kind of gently flick it like that. Now I'm gonna get that dry brush technique where I just have some high level clouds. Now the clouds are lighter than that, but I wanna have two values. I'm gonna have this darker value and then I'm gonna put the lighter value on top a little bit later. So I'm just gonna go through and I'm just doing these closest clouds right now with this gray. And now I'm gonna just start lightening this gray as I go. I'm just adding some more white to the color I'm gonna add a little bit more blue to my color. So I'm still taking that, that, that mix that I had, but I'm gonna add some more of that ultramarine blue, maybe a touch more brown, just to darken up that color smidge. And I'm gonna go in and now put in some of those darker bottom edges. And because my paint is fairly dry, I'm gonna really push and wiggle it into that brush and just gently kind of feather it over top where I see some of those areas. In places, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna push and just kind of wiggle it around a little bit and then stop and pick it up off the canvas so that I get that kind of, um, that soft fluffy kind of a look. With the, and I'm just by wiggling that brush around and adding more or less pressure in places. And I'm just squinting to kind of see where I see the biggest of these, these masses. Now I'm gonna go for some of my whites. I'm still not gonna go straight to pure white, but I'm gonna take white with a tiny bit of brown. I'm not gonna add any blue. So I'm taking white and a dot of brown and adding it there because that's a warmer white. Yeah. And can you see how that almost has kind of that warm feeling to it, but it's not white yet. I saved my whites for the very end. And I wanna soften up some of these edges in a bit, but for now, I'm just gonna get the rough shape that I see in there without worrying about perfection. Just by moving the brush around randomly. And then I'll soften the edges afterwards because with acrylic or oil, you can soften your edges later. I mean, my paint is gonna dry quickly, so I'm not gonna be able to manipulate it too much here. So what I'm gonna do is not worry about it. I'm gonna work around that dry time. And I can go back, even though I like to start with my dark values and put my lights on top, 
That doesn't mean I can't go back in and add some more darks later if I need to. And then I can go back in with nice thick white for any of those bright whites that I want to have. In fact, I'm going to switch to a smaller brush and go in now with some bright whites. And I'm going to lay them down really nice and thick where I want them thick. And I can always go in and just soften the edges with the dry brush afterwards. But now notice how the whites are really going to pop in contrast to the light white that I, not light white, just slightly darker white that I had mixed with the brown. And then for this whole bottom area, because they're all farther away and all much smaller, I might just start with that light gray. That was the mix of that blue and brown with mostly white. And I had used mostly brown for these closer clouds. But here's another one of those tricks is, as an illusionist. Um, if things are a little bit cooler as they get farther away from you, then they, they feel like they, they should be getting farther away from you. So I'm going to use more blue mixed in with this, this gray, even though it's going to be lighter. So i got to lighten that up a little bit. And I see some, some blues in there as some shadows on a few of these clouds. So I'm just gonna put a few of those in here, little by little, but again, not a lot of contrast. The bulk of the contrast and detail was in all of this stuff up here. And anywhere I wanna soften it, wipe off my brush. Just, I can dry brush it, or if it's still wet, I can manipulate it, okay? If I want it to look like it's raining, I could take some of those um, colors and I could just start, you know, putting dry brush marks in on an angle downward and suddenly it would seem like maybe there's some patches of rain coming through. So that's where I blur those edges and I'm just dry brushing. I'm flicking that brush downward. For oil painters you could just blend what was there. And this acrylic is still a little bit wet. Now this looks really simple. It's, it is in a way simplistic, but really what it's about is about hyper observing and squinting so you're not looking at every little detail. Because if you look at every little detail, you'll be like, oh, but wait, there's a little cloud here that's kind of like this and like this. And then it you loses its fun and it becomes too detailed looking and not, not as realistic. That's the thing that I found. The minute I started loosening up a little bit more and painting kind of the impression of what I saw instead of trying to make it look exactly like what I saw, it started looking actually more realistic than not. I'm gonna take a lighter version of that watercolor, which was just the um, ultramarine blue and a little bit of brown, and I'm just gonna add some white to it. Push and wiggle it into that brush, and then I'm gonna wipe it off so that there's no paint left on the outside of the brush. It's all just trapped inside. I'm just gonna lift this up a bit so we can see it. If I wanna create an area of sparkly light, you can just wipe that brush across the canvas and see how you can just see those little specks, but it gives me that idea of that highlight. That's what a dry brush is, basically. 